Hello, my name is John McCann. I live in Arlington, Massachusetts, just outside of Boston in the United States. I truly appreciate the invitation to speak at this colloquium. I want to thank Yoshi Sensai and Tokyo Polytechnic Color Lab for this invitation. This talk is about art helping science and science helping art. I'm going to share with you today three different ideas about color. First is that today's color is the product of many different fields, including painting, imaging, all kinds of imaging, physics, physics of light and the interaction of matter, and the study of human color vision. The second idea I'd like to talk with you today about is that it's the edges, not the amount of light that's important in seeing and understanding color and how we see it. Third idea, I'd like to combine the two. In other words, to discuss making a personal framework of your own background and history of television. My personal view is that all these fields are mixed together, intertwined, and have helped each other out over the history of making colored images. History is a plot of ideas versus time. Our education teaches us that these approaches to color are different plots, one for each discipline. Each of these disciplines stays on its own track, just as a train stays on its own track in Shinjuku. One of the themes of my talk is that all disciplines grew up together. They share common tools, common observations, and common conclusions. What will we find when we discuss color appearances using all four disciplines simultaneously at each point in historical time? Newton became famous for his prism experiments with light, but who became the most influential painters from that time? What was the state of our color printing in 1700? What can we learn about our color appearances from this approach? Idea two, edges, not light. We're looking at a very simple display here. We have nine different rectangles. They appear white to gray, to black. And we want to investigate the question of why does this look white and this look black? And so through all nine rectangles. The first hypothesis is that the light, the amount of light from the square is controlling the appearance, namely that this square looks gray because it has 146 digit behind it, while the white has 255 and the black has 10. The second equally good hypothesis is that it is the edges. It is the relationship of the 146 to the 230 background that is the responsible for this appearance of gray. And so it is 255 over 230, 146 over 230, 10 over 230, that makes these have different appearances. We need to do an experiment to sort this out. The experiment's very simple. We'll use Photoshop to make a display. We have nine different patches that all have the same digit 146. All gray display digits are 146. The background is zero. In the second part of the experiment, we're going to change the zero to 255. And we're going to observe the different gray squares. In the third part of the experiment, we're going to change the background to being 255 on the left to zero on the right. 
we also are going to then observe the appearance of the gray squares in a variable density surround. We can test to see if this is accurate by stopping the video and getting out your digital meter and looking at the digits behind each of these things. I recommend that you do this. Now, so what's the experiment? Just like in Photoshop, we have layers. We have layers of nine identical gray rectangles. This is equal to this is equal to this. The backgrounds are different. We place this on top of this and get this. We're going to make a video. And the video is we're going to begin at the this. And over 10 seconds, we're going to dissolve. We're going to slowly merge the two images and come out with a 100% white background. We're going to continue for 10 seconds and move to the gradient display, and we're going to then return. So your job as being an observer in this experiment is to observe the colors of the nine squares. If the amount of light is important, then these nine squares should be the same here, here, and here. If, however, edges are important, edges are more important than the amount of light, then we should see differences as we proceed down and back. Let's do the experiment. Well, what did we see when we looked at the gray patches? I saw a lot. I saw a flash of white when the backgrounds equal 146. I saw apparent motion. I saw many things going on. But let's for the moment just agree upon the following observation, namely that appearance is built up from edges. The hypothesis that the amount of light controlled the appearance of those gray areas uh, was not confirmed by this experiment. The light from the gray is constant. It was always 146. The edge, the gray to background edge, was variable. Appearances are variable. It leads us to think that the edges control the appearances. It's all about edges, not the light. But wait, there's more. Edward Land demonstrated his black and white Mondrian for the first time when he received the Ives Medal from the Optical Society of America in 1967. In that, he demonstrated that the Mondrian, that this high reflectance paper at the top and this low reflectance paper at the bottom sent the same amount of light to the observer's eyes. He asked the observers to report the appearance of this high reflectance paper and the low reflectance paper. The observers reported that the top appeared white and the bottom appeared black. 
Unfortunately, the technology at the time didn't allow us to get better representations of this. The real scene looked much better. But the simple point was equal luminances in the same scene at the same time had equal input to the eye, but gave very different white black responses. In today's world, we worry about whether the digits were equal. But there's even more. Let's look at a local region in the black and white Mondria. And my job was to go and make the meter measurements. So I measured 160 and 160 from two adjacent areas. Let's look at that in more detail. Along this piece, because there was more illumination down here than there was up here, this single uniform gray reflectance changed in its radiance measurements from 200 to 160, traveling up Mondrian. However, you can find nearby that same area measured 160 when it went across an edge between the higher reflectance paper and the lower reflectance paper. Let's blow this up some more. When you have an edge, you see a change in appearance when you go from 160 to 200. But if you have a gradient, when you go from 160 to 200, it's barely visible. You can just about see it, but it's almost invisible. Now, when we go from photons to colors, and we have a sequence of events that everyone agrees upon. We have a light source, sometimes called illumination. We have an object, which is sometimes described by its surface. We have the light that reaches the eye right in front of the cornea. We have interocular glare that transforms the scene into the image of the receptors. We have the receptors, the important thing is the physics of the quanta catch. We'll talk about that some more. Neural spatial comparisons to generate sensations, namely appearances, and perceptions, namely recognitions. Two scenes lead to two models of color vision. We have a single spot of light used by colorimetry. We have two halves that are different spectral compositions. And we mix the colors on one side so that they match the other side. And from that, James Clark Maxwell in 1860 was able to derive a way of measuring the spectral response of the eye to color. It took just about a century for Brown and Wald and Flax to Bell and McNichol to make the actual measurements of the spectral sensitivities of the photoreceptors in the outer segment. But that leads to a whole area of color that's defined by the quanta catch of a single spot of light. On the other hand, we have a natural scene. And if we want to understand or reproduce, or have a theory of how we see color in the natural scene, we need to worry about the quanta catch of the entire field of view. Let's start with the colorimetry and the molecular physics. This is Dowling's drawing of the retina. This is the rod and cone outer segments where the molecular physics takes place, where the light matter interactions take place. David Wright did the experiments that became the basis of the CIE 1931 color matching functions. Where does colorimetry end and apparent science begin? Colorimetry ends once the light has been absorbed by the color receptors in the retina. And that apparent science begins as the signals from the receptors start their journey to the visual cortex. So a color match is controlled by the quanta catch of the receptors, the rod and cone outer segments. And uh, these light matter interactions happen at an angstrom level. It's when the photon hits the rhodopsin. Each of these photon 
opsin interactions take place independently in each receptor independent of all the other receptors. Now, colorimetry has a hidden assumption. It's okay, it's a good assumption. Namely, that interocular glia does not spatially transform the radiances when they are adjusted to be a match. There's as much scattered light coming from the left side to the right side as is equal to the light coming from the right side to the left side. Scatter cancels out. There is no edge. There is equal quanta catch at either side. And that's what Maxwell was looking for in 1860. It's curious, however, that colorimetry describes absorptions very carefully. It worries a lot about the macular pigment, the transmission of ocular fluids, the transmission of the lens, but it doesn't worry about the much larger effects caused by interocular glare where the light gets redistributed by the physiology. So when we do an experiment with a single spot of light, as colorimetry does, we have spot experiments make two important hidden assumptions. The first is that color is equal to the quanta catch. That means you're excluding all the physiology. Everything past the rod and cone outer segments doesn't count. Second hidden assumption is that there's no interocular glare. That excludes the optics. And as we shall see later, it also excludes all of the neurophysiology. So from the colorimetry point of view, we have the light, the object, the light at the cornea. That's what we calculate the X, Y, Z, and that characterizes the light. David Wright assumed that there's no glare and claimed that the receptors are the end of colorimetry. And that certainly is true. However, it's important that you make the assumption that there is no glare because otherwise there is a disconnect between the stimulus on the cornea and the stimulus on the receptors. It's fine when you're doing matches, there is no problem. When we go from the spot of light to a natural scene, that's an HDR scene, there are a number of things we have to remember. First of all, we cannot display an accurate natural scene in the screen. Even if this were an HDR system, it would not portray the actual radiances found in the original scene. So we'll use this substitute, John Constable's painting in 1825 of Salisbury Cathedral from the Bishop's Garden. There are three things to remember about natural HDR scenes. First of all, the range of reflectances of objects is limited by surface properties of, of objects and light to about 30 to 1. However, the scene's dynamic range in a sunny day is easily 3,000 to 1. When you have such a large dynamic range, the third thing to remember is that you have maximal interocular glare. So, as we go through the visual pathway, certainly we want to take the quanta catch of the receptors and pass them into the neural spatial comparisons when we study the high dynamic range scene. As we go along the visual pathway and leave the retina to the lateral geniculate body, to the visual cortex, to V4 visual cortex, to V4 and 5 beyond that, we see that there's a whole array of different spatial image processing taking place. It's interesting that if you shine a spot of light on these receptors and measure things with electrodes in this region, you get a response of light. What was troubling neurophysiology for decades was that when you stick an electrode in the cortex back here, in the visual cortex, nothing much happens. That is, nothing much happens until 1962. This is Hubel and Weasel's first uh, published paper on the neurophysiology of the cat. So we have a cat. 
There is an electrode placed in the cat's primary visual cortex, but it's a mammalian cortex and it is quite similar to our own. That electrode is connected to a speaker. So it amplifies the sound of each speech. David Hubel used to kid in his talks that uh, he studied vision by audition. He would listen to the spikes and know that the cell was active. Now, the experiment was the cat was alert and it looked at the screen. David would project a spot of light onto the screen and Tonson would mark where the spot was in the visual field and the intensity of the response. But nothing much happened when you used a spot of light. However, by accident, they discovered in changing a slide that a bar was the ideal stimulus for stimulating that cell in the cortex. So that unexpected observation in 25 years of meticulous work won them the Nobel Prize in physiology. The idea is if you have these lateral geniculate cells, above those in the cortex up here, these cells are these cells. If you put a stripe of light across those cells excitatory center, you will get this spot to fire. If you move an edge across the field of view, you'll get this cell to fire. Those are the cells that were giving you the artificial movement in the experiment you just watched. So, Scenes. We can use a spot of light to explore the physics of the situation. It has minimal glare. You are able to measure the light matter interactions, the molecular physics that controls the first stage of color. XYZ colorimetry predicts matches and it does it beautifully well. Second is an appearance model. Natural scenes have light from all the segments, there's considerable glare and it varies with the contents of the scene. These assumptions are that all of vision is involved. Receptors plus neurons control color. Quanta catch is essential, but it's the input to the neuron spatial comparisons that controls appearance. Which model of color fits your use of color? If you're interested in the molecular physics, then you should consider doing your work and analyzing your work using a spot of light. If, however, you're interested in studying the natural scene and you want to say, I see color, then you need to consider what's happening with the neural spatial comparisons in the HDR world. Again, we have light and we have edges. Let's take a look at picture making history. From the earliest cave paintings to 20th century OLED displays. We'll begin with painting. In Borneo, a picture of an animal was recently discovered that's dated as 40,000 years old. 380 centuries before these see. It's much older than the 16,000 year old Lascaux caves in France. Here's a fourth century BC painting on silk. It's remarkable that uh, silk could last that long. Here's a 12th century painting on a scroll. It renders the children without the environment. It just represents the abstract idea of the person, but does not record the light environment of the real world. 13th century, Italy, Asia. 1490 is the date of Leonardo's painting of the woman with the urban. It regarded by some as the first caroscuro painting in which 
the light falling on the subject and the subject are portrayed with the same intensity and accuracy. Not only does it have perspective in its drawing and its shape, but it pays careful attention to both the subject and the illumination falling on it. It is the object and the light that's portrayed accurately here. Caravaggio's 1600 painting, it's really not about the subjects as much as it is the light. Certainly the light plays an important role in this vision. In 1620, Hornhurst painted this challenging scene, four people portrayed from the light of a single candle. 19th continued with the recording, the scene and the light. Monet's portrait, a uh, family portrait of his wife and child, had them in the shadow. But what a beautiful job he did in rendering the light in the scene. 21st century art gives us still another view of what we can make with the artist's hand. Now, personally, I think color becomes more interesting when we compare the threads, the relationship of painting, imaging, physics, and vision at the same time in history. That's what we're going to do in the next couple of slides, is we're going to look at the different fields. It's important to realize that what I'm calling imaging is from the earliest days, people made rubbings and digital printing and displays. All of these are in the category of imaging. In 1500, that was the time when Leonardo began chiaroscuro HDR painting. At the same time, Durer has made this print of a rhinoceros, even though he never saw one. And Leonardo not only did the painting, but he also observed in his writings that colors are most beautiful when surrounded by their opposites. It was 500 years earlier when Al Hazen observed that light was imaged on the retina. And that for me was the beginning of my uh, framework for color. We'd have to wait 172 years for Newton's prism experiments because at the time Copernicus was discovered that the earth rotates around the sun. In 1672, Isaac Newton did his famous double prism experiment, separated white light and recombined it. In 1704, he published that and many other things in his book, Optics. In that, he included the statement, for the rays to speak properly are not colored. In them is nothing else than a certain power and disposition to stir up a sensation of this or that color. That's a landmark in the theory of color. Early 1700s, LeBlanc made color separation prints using mesotin, an easy way to make a tonality like a primitive half tone. And he used different separations. He created all the separations by eye, by hand, and he fused them together to make colored prints. So color printing became quite active as early as 1700. That time Vermeer was painting the light with a pearl earring. In 1802, Thomas Young published a paper in the Royal Society. It's a long 36 page paper. Also in that paper, there was a footnote. It was just a paragraph long. And that Thomas Young suggested trichromacy theory. In 1807, color prints were available all over Europe. This particular print was made by printing an engraving, black and white, and adding color with watercolors. This is a painting by Goya of the King. It's an unusual painting because he didn't paint the King. He painted the symbolic parts that represent Spain and the Spanish justice system. He didn't like the king. 1825, Goethe published his book, Zofabalera, and uh, 
attacking uh, Newton and New Newton personally and Newton's views. It was the time when the 36 views of Mount Fuji were printed and the Salisbury Cathedral. 1839, Daguerre made some of his first uh, photographic images. At the same time, Chevreau uh, published his book on the harmony of color and contrast. Now, Chevreau was a famous French chemist. And the Gobelins Tapestry Factory, still there in Paris today, hired him because Germans had better blacks in their tapestry. Chevreau soon found that the dyes were very similar, but the spatial arrangement of the dyes in the tapestries was the cause of the German better tapestries. Faraday was working on cathode ray tubes and Turner was painting his last painting. In 1860 to 1872, uh, Maxwell established the basis of colorimetry. He also made the first color photograph. And while Herring, towards the end of this period, was raising issues about color constancy, and John Martin made his remarkably dramatic HDR paintings. 1853, silver halide negatives were terrible. You had to make them yourself, and you had, usually had to make them out of doors in a tent. This is a print from the Texas University of Texas Museum by Baldus. He used 10 paper negatives to make this beautiful print. It, it really is a spectacular image, and uh, it was made from a combination of multiple low dynamic range exposures. It's the only thing you could do back then, it's 150 years before digital multiple exposures became popular. 1931, we have the uh, publication of the CIE standard for colorimetry. We have Dolly's paintings and Edward Weston's photography. The very important thing, the Optical Society of America separated brightness, which was a measure of appearance, from luminance, which is a measure of light. Ansel Adams in 1939 described his zone system for rendering high dynamic range scenes. The idea was to capture the scene's entire range, make a best effort. Can't do it all, but make your best effort. Preserve the edges and smooth gradients, control the exposure, and render the artist's visualization. How do you do that? Essentially, Adams was able to do what we do today in Photoshop. He was able to darken regions or lighten regions. He did it by adding extra light called burning or removing extra light called dodging. It was all a matter of controlling the edges and the gradients. This now is Ansel's most famous photograph, Moonrise and Fernandez. My friend John Sexton worked with Adams for many years, and he made this print, any dodging and burning. When I was a kid, you'd take a photograph on your camera, you'd bring the film to the drugstore, the drugstore would make a print, and there was no special extra processing, all prints were printed the same. If you brought this to the drugstore and you did nothing to the negative, this is the image you would get. If you add dodging and burning, this is what you get. Spatial image processing to render HDR. It's the same story we've been talking about, edges and gradients. 1955 to 65, Noise introduced the first integrated circuit. Digital electronics was on the threshold of beginning. Evan Land did work in red and white photography, and David Hubel was starting to do his research on simple and complex cells in the, the Meridian cortex. Fergus Campbell was looking at imaging through the spatial frequency domain. Evan Land made instant color film for the first time. 
Walt Disney, got a star on Hollywood's Walk of Fame. Astro Boy, Enemy, made his debut. This period is interesting because it is the beginning of the end of something. Analog electronics was at its peak in the 1970s, but digital electronics was about to change everything. In 1981, Morita of Sony showed his Mavica camera. Its introduction at a press conference in New York City, changed almost instantly the research plans of all imaging companies worldwide, both film and video companies. It's kind of interesting as well that Marita of Sony was a good friend of Edward Land at Polaroid. Chuck Close made portraits using pixels of rolled up gray papers. IBM made the scanning tunneling microscope that is able to image atoms. And in our lab, we were able to calculate the appearances of a quarter million pixels in 2.7 minutes, and then write them on film. Let's turn to the third part of this talk, and that is how do you establish your framework? What are the essential ideas? Newton was quoted in a letter for saying that he saw further because he was standing on the shoulders of giants. Who are your giants? For me, it's Al Heisen, Newton, and all the people who did molecular physics to describe very accurately the light that's at the eye. It's Tom Vandenberg's glare spread function that helps us calculate what's on the receptors in the eye. How the receptors work is the history of LeBlanc and Young and Maxwell and colorimetry and George Wald and Mark Stabil and Glass spread function comes from the work Boss and Vandenberg. We see here we start off with something almost a million to one. And what do we get? Well, if we convolve this image with this spread function, we get this image. This is what it looks like. This is the view of it. This is a plot of it. And you can see the effect of glare is quite substantial for a high dynamic range image. We started off with a million to one, we ended up with a hundred to one. If we ask the observer, he can discriminate to a range of about a thousand to one. Vision has two different, very powerful spatial image processing mechanisms. We have a high contrast image that's on the cornea. We have a high contrast sensation that comes from these low contrast glare limited scenes that are falling on the receptors. Let's look at another high dynamic range scene. This is an illustration. This is a map of the luminances measured from the display. The display does not look like this because of its great dynamic range. However, this is a good illustration of what's coming to your eye. If you were looking at the real scene, the maximum is over 2000 candela per million square. The minimum is slightly over a 10th. The dynamic range is 18,000 to one. If we ask the observer to describe the appearance between white 100 and black, one versus luminance of the display, we get the following results. The maximum is 100. This square decreases the luminance by about 20 to 1, but the observer reports that this is quite close to black. If we move to the second circle, its luminance is here. 
it looks almost white and it slowly gets darker and darker to the same near black. If we look at the third circle, we see that the luminance goes from here to here and the fourth circle from here to here. If we plot the maximum luminance in each of these circles, this, 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 we see a very low slope line. This slope matches stellar magnitude in astronomy. We'll call it the Hipparchus line after the first person to describe magnitude estimation of how bright the stars are, and that was Hipparchus in the second century BC. Now we see, however, that if we look at what's happening in a circle, there is a high slope, a very high slope response function to the amount of light. So what the observer sees is that this, this gets dark very fast. It goes from the actual brightest white in the scene to almost black and so on. So we have two different response functions that we can see here. Namely, the maxima changes slowly and less than maxima changes rapidly. What do painters do? Well, you can see that child is the brightest thing in the field of view, and that was painted with pure white. St. Joseph is further from the candle, so he is painted slightly darker. The two other ch children in the scene are painted still darker. However, in the local region around each of these, there is a high slope response function. The painters have manipulated the edges and the gradients to render the appearance of the high dynamic range seen in low dynamic range paint. That's what the painter has learned to do, how to render in a 30 to 1 dynamic range something that looks like a 3000 to 1. We discussed earlier the lands black and white Mondrian in 1981. We made a real life natural image of the same scene where the same amount of light came from the white and the shadow and the black in the sun. We did this using a high dynamic range, color negative, a standard negative has quite a bit of uh, dynamic range, roughly 3000 to one. We made print one and could see the white and print two to see the black. But since the paper we printed the negative on has only a range of uh, roughly 30 to 1, that's its range of reflectances, we don't have this problem. Humans can see, because of the spatial image processing, both of these at the same time have no problem. What we did to make the bottom picture was that we took the negative, we scanned it, we calibrated it in terms of the amount of light, and we use the spatial image processing algorithm in some special purpose hardware. This is the image we made. This is the image that renders the edges and gradients appropriately by making spatial comparisons. This is the hardware we used back in 1975. Uh, all these memory chips are the memory needed to hold 512 by 512 by 24 bit. That's a one bit board using 64 16K chips. What's the idea behind the processing? That's very simple. If you have a photograph in the same amount of light in the shadow from the white as the sun from the black, the measures are the same. However, the edges of the same pairs of reflectances are constant. So build the image out of the ratios. In 1987, we were using hybrid things that involved a, uh, a Seiko Epson LCD, a little pocket TV LCD to print a 35 millimeter slide on Polaroid film. Uh, we used software as well, this is the scene of the sun and shade. 
before and after processing. Kyoto Temple. Mission in the Southwest of the United States. 2002, HP made a camera that had Tetranex technology in it. The camera had a normal picture. Uh, digital flash, that was the name for Red Max. That, they, that was a nice name. And uh, low digital flash, high digital flash. Bob Sobel was the chief engineer for this. And before and after digital flash. This is a pair of photographs taken with an HP 945 camera. It is a high dynamic range scene. A standard photograph on the left, a retinex processed image on the right. This spatial image processing made major changes in the scene rendition. All the parameters of the calculation are fixed in the camera firmware. When we apply this algorithm to six different scenes, we see variable scene changes. The algorithm uses a simple spatial comparison and local normalization, a reset. There is no top-down scene analysis, no computation intensive analysis, just simple bottom-up spatial comparisons that result in major or small or minimal changes in the rendition of the scene. Image modification varies with the content of the scene automatically. It's all about edges and gradients. Today we use uh, in our cell phones, these phenomenal stitching engines. If you want to make a panoramic image, it's very simple. The camera takes all these pictures very quickly and slices them up into pieces and stitches them together. My friend Ali Ritzi calls this the Frankenstein paradigm. You chop up the image and you find the best body parts and you put it back together. And the trick is you have to do it extremely fast. So Apple's taken away the HDR setting. All their pictures are HDR. How does it work? Well, you capture as many pictures as you can. You have different spectra, you have different exposures, you have different times, you can even have different focal lengths. You apply the Frankenstein paradigm. You chop up the image into segments, you analyze the segments using many quality metrics, you sew the best segments together, you integrate the best edges, you implement using specialized hardware, you keep the very best and throw away the rest very fast. It's finding the best segments that have the best edges, it's controlling the gradients and it's putting it together. Here are three pictures on the left a standard control photograph taken using a 945 HP digital camera. The camera sold in 2002. It used the Retinex algorithm. On the right, an iPhone X camera sold in 2019. The Apple X camera used a hardware solution, while the 2002 HP camera used a firmware algorithm. When we look at the two pictures and their HDR rendition, the middle and the right, we see that they have similar characteristics. They emphasize edges and they minimize gradients and they improve the appearance of the scene. Electronic imaging is just learning to do the spatial manipulations developed by painters five centuries ago. 
My wife, Mary, and I had hoped to return to Japan for this colloquium. We look forward to seeing old friends such as Miyaki Sensei. In preparing the talk, I learned just how little I truly understood about early color research in Japan. I'd hope to learn more from the other speakers and from the audience. I still do, virtually right now, but hopefully in person in the future. Thank you very much for the opportunity of sharing my work, and I look forward to hearing much more about your work. Thank you.